I, uh, pastor called me. Uh, well, let me start over. I was talking to a friend of mine that I went to school with, and uh, he was like a couple of years behind me. And he's a seven day Adventist. And we were discussing the spirit. He lives in Kansas City, and we were discussing the spirit. And uh, we didn't come to any kind of agreement concerning the spirit. And he's convinced that man is not a spirit. So when Pastor called me Monday, this was Sunday that I was talking to my friend, and Pastor called me Monday and wanted me to bring a word. I didn't know what I was going to bring the word on. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I just gave it to you. You was talking to your friend about the spirit. Bring a word on the spirit. So that said, we're going to talk about the spirit. And the title of this message is, You Are a Spirit Being. We're going to start with uh, Rick, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, please. You are a spirit being. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. That is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose, and may your spirit and soul and body be complete, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that scripture right there is very, very enlightening. Right here, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he said this, or when he wrote this, and he refers to man as a triune being. And one of the three components, we're going to discuss those, Paul refers to, first of all, the spirit. Paul refers to the soul. And Paul refers to the body of a human being. So what we're going to do is look at those three components, beginning with the spirit of man. That's what Paul started. That's what we're going to start. Because the spirit, pastor has told us this and taught us this forever and ever, the spirit is the real you, not the body, not the soul. The spirit is the real you. Rick, put up Genesis 126, please. Then God said, let us, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not the physical, but a spiritual personality and more likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea. Now I'm going to stop right there. God said, let us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, make man in our image in our image and our likeness and let them he said let them now that tells me we gotta I just can't I don't even know what to say about God God is so awesome he was thinking ahead because he only made created Adam when he did that but he said let them be over the fish of the sea and the birds and the fowl of the air because he knew other men were going to come. That's how God thinks ahead. He's, he's more or less a planner. Okay? So, and birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. Now, this is what I was trying to convey to my, my friend, that the Bible reveals that man 
is a spirit being. Man is a spirit being. And we were made in the likeness of God. The term man, that's a generic term, for huma comes from humanity. Okay? Now, God is a spirit being. Well, you might say, well, Willie, how you know God is a spirit being? Jesus said it. Jesus said it, he was a spirit being. Jesus ought to know, because Jesus has been with God eternities past, and he's still with God. So if Jesus knows what God is or what God ain't, he ought to know. So, I think that uh, makes him an authority. Amen? Amen? Now, here's what Jesus said. Uh, Rick, put up John 4, 24, please. This is what Jesus said. This is Jesus speaking. God is spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So if God is a spirit, according to Jesus now, whom we serve, if God is a spirit and we are made in his image, that makes us a spirit as well. That makes us a spirit as well. God is a spirit. Now, we got to grab a hold of that. God is spirit. We are made in his image, so we are spirit too. This means that all human beings, first and foremost, are spirit beings. On the inside of every living human body, there's a human spirit. Now, I'm going to be mentioning spirit all through this. So, fasten your seatbelt. Now, this is the real person, the one created in the image of God. Now, let me, let me back that up with scripture. Rick, put up Job 32, 8, please. This is the real person. In every human body, there is a human spirit. But there is a vital force and a spirit of intelligence in man, and the breath of the Almighty God gives him understanding. Now, when Job said this, he was speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Everybody that wrote stuff in the Bible was speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, when people say, well, man wrote the Bible, it ain't true. Yeah, man wrote it, but God told him what to write. They wrote it because God told him what to write. They was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when he said that, that confirms when Job said this, it confirms what uh, the Apostle Paul and what Jesus Christ both taught. That confirms it when Job said what he said, that there is a spirit being inside of every living human body. It's a real person. That's the real person, that spirit. And the, the one who created after the image and the likeness of God. So you got a spirit inside of you. I got a spirit inside of me. This is just a shell. We'll get to that later on. You see, it's the spirit of a man that's born again. The spirit of a man that's born again. Again, when Christ becomes that person's savior, it's the spirit of a man that's born again. The new creation, which the Bible speaks of, that uh, occurs in the human spirit, not in the soul, and not in the body. It's the spirit. And it also talks about that in 2 Corinthians. You don't have to put that up. But this is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Rick, put up 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now I say this, believers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit nor be part of the kingdom of God. Now I say this, it says brother in there, but my Bible says believers, same thing. But I say this, believers, that the flesh cannot inherit nor take part in the kingdom of God. 
He's talking to us. Now, there are non-believers out there, too. But th some of those non-believers think that when they die, if they go to heaven, this body going with them. You got people out there that believe that. I never thought my friend and, and would believe that we went to the same church when we were growing up. It would believe that man is not a spirit. But people are believing everything because you got false doctrines out there. But what we go by is the truth. The Holy Bible. It ain't been twisted as far as Christians are concerned. And it's the real, the true word of God. You see, when a human being is born again, oh, let me finish reading that, part of the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable mortal inherit the imperishable immortal. The perishable, this body, this body is perishing every day. This body can't go into heaven in this condition. It's got to be changed. The Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, you shall be changed. This body is perishing. It can't go into the kingdom of heaven. Because when a human body is born, I mean a human being is born again, they become brand new in the spirit. They become brand new in the spirit. Not in the body, but in the spirit. This is why, let me ask you a question. When you got saved and you looked in the mirror the next day. Didn't you look the same the next day that you did the day before you got saved? It was your spirit that got saved. That body didn't change. So the spirit is the one that was changed, not the body. And your spirit was the one that was saved, not your body. Pastor Bob always said we got to nail that down. We got to nail that down. God is a spirit. Therefore, a man is a spirit. The spirit of man, the real person, departs the body and heads to heaven or hell at the moment of physical expiration. That body's going to go one or two places. Heaven, or, I mean, not the body, the spirit, heaven or hell. Because because of this fact, notice now, I didn't say this is supposed to happen or this might happen. This is a fact. It's going to happen. When this body expires, that spirit is going to come out and it's going one or two places. It's going to heaven or it's going to hell. And we have the uh, absolute confidence that everybody that was born again that has already departed and left us we're going to see him again yeah. I'm going to see Martha again yeah. I'm going to see my dad my grandmother mm -hmm. you're going to see your husband you're going to see your brother you know we're going to see everybody that we loved that was born again we're going to see them all again I'm going to see Kirk he out there his body is. I'm going to see him. Can't wait. Because the Bible says, you don't have to put this one up, Rick, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, I was talking to my friend about that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's another thing that he disagreed with. All I can do is pray for him. I planted the seed. Take <laughs> he believes what he believes. I believe what I believe. We had a discussion. Not an argument. It was a discussion. What he was trying to do to me was win me over to his side. And maybe become... A seven day Adventist. But what I was trying to do to, for him was to show him that he was in error. I wasn't trying to win him over. God would win him over. But just to show him that he's in error. Because we are spirit beings. 
Like I said, there are a lot of false teachings out there. A lot of false teaching. And to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, that's just another reference of the fact of physical expiration. The spirit, the real person, it vacates the body and heads to its inter- eternal destination. Now, ain't you glad about that as a, as a believer? Ain't you glad about that? If you're glad about that, say amen. The scripture also says, Rick, put up Philippians 1, 23, please. But I am hard pressed between the two. I have the desire to leave this world and be with Christ. For that is far, far better. Now, I see two things in this scripture. First, this is another reference to the fact that the human spirit actually departs the human body. I have a desire to leave this world and be with Christ. I have a desire to leave this world right here and be with Christ. And the second thing is we see that to depart the human body for the Christian is just not better. It's far, far better. It's better than anything we could ever imagine. Anything that we could ever imagine. Therefore, if we've been grieving over someone we lost that was born again, who has already departed for heaven before us, we need to make some adjustments. We need to make some adjustment. We need to make a decision as a conscious act of our own free will that we are going to receive the joy of the Lord today and no longer the grief of disbelief. We got to make that decision. You see, our loved ones, they ain't lost. They ain't out there lost in space somewhere. No. They ain't out there floating on a cloud somewhere surrounded by a bunch of half-naked uh, little baby angels shooting arrows. You see that on TV, shooting arrows and, and stuff like that. No, they ain't, no sir, uh-uh, no, no ma'am, they ain't out there like that. Our loved ones are on the planet heaven. That's where they are right now, enjoying life to the absolute fullest. Can I get amen? amen. Yeah, all right. The Bible says that their present circumstances are far better than anything we could ever imagine. Even our little bitty mind can't imagine what kind of fun they have. You couldn't drag them folks back down here on this earth with the curse of law and sin and death. You couldn't drag them down here with a bulldozer. You couldn't get them folks out of heaven. But we on our way. We on our way. See, ain't no curse on the planet heaven. Ain't no curse there. As a matter of fact, just about everything you see on earth is a replica of what's going on in heaven, but it's just better there. It's just better there. That means no death, no corruption, and no loss of any kind whatsoever. Ever. 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 As far as the east is from the west. You can't measure that. Eternity upon eternities. No loss whatsoever. Ever. Rick, put up Revelation 22, 3, please. I want to back that up. There will be, there will no longer exist anything that is cursed. Because sin and illness and death are gone. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And his blood bond servants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. Now that's planet heaven. Not planet earth. No more sorrow. No more weeping and crying and pain and cancer and everything else that sin 
brought into this world. No more of none of that. It, it's going to be, planet heaven is going to be just the way we right now wish it could be here. We would love for it to be like that here right now. I know I would. So if we've been fixating on the heartbreaking circumstances surrounding our loved one's departure, it's time for us to take authority over our thought life. It's time for us to take a part uh, over our thought life because the Bible says that we should cast down every vain imagination and every high and lofty soul for thought that is attempting to exalt itself falsely above that which is revealed in the Bible. And you can find that in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. So it's time for us to receive the joy of the Lord in this matter. That's how we, we are going to be able to, to go on. See, once we know the truth, we can go on. I've said this before. I cut that grass out there in that graveyard. My wife's body's out there. If I didn't know the truth, I couldn't go out there and cut that grass. I couldn't do it. But I know the truth. I know that my wife ain't out there in that graveyard. That body that was housing that spirit is in that graveyard. My wife is absent from the body. The real Martha is absent from the body in prison with the Lord. That's where all our loved ones that believed are. They're not in the grave. Pastor Bob, I love it when he says, if I pass away and y'all having my funeral in here and you looking at grace, oh, he looking good. He said, I ain't there. You ain't looking at me. You looking at the shell that will had me in it. I'm going to be with the Lord. Boy, that's a great thought. I mean, that's a, this should just make you feel so good. Knowing that you're going to be with God and your loved ones from eternity to eternity. Like the old folks say, you can't beat that with a stick. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You can find that in Nehemiah 8.10. Now, if we call ourselves believers, then it's time for us to believe what the Bible says about our loved ones. It's time for us to believe what the Bible says about us. When you know who you are in Christ, you ain't got nothing to worry about. But we still have to believe what the Bible says about our loved ones and about us. Now, I went a little bit longer on this point right here, but I, helped it. I hope it helped. But it is important for us to realize that we are a spirit. And that goes for every human being that's been birthed upon this earth. So all we got to do is just relax. We know the truth. Relax in it. Now we're going to talk about the soul of man. So what is the soul of man? The mind of man. That's the soul. The soul is comprised of the mind, the will, the intellect, and the emotions. The human soul is where the human being acquires knowledge. The soul is like a, a storage and operational area for information, it's for, for learning, it's for logic, it's for reasoning. That's what the soul is composed of. It's kind of like a, a, a hard drive on a computer, only it's alive. But it assesses knowledge and you can, in your mind, recall something that happened 20 years ago just like a computer, but it's, it's, it's alive. And another thing, it's also the battlefield for a Christian. It's the battlefield for a Christian. And this is where a lot of our battles are won and a lot of our battles are lost. That's why Paul said, in, put up in Ephesians 4.23, please. 
That's why Paul said in 423, to be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. What he's telling us is we need to fill our soul with the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God's word so we'll be armed way ahead of time when Satan comes to deceive, deceive us in any given area of our life, we'll be armed way ahead of time. We, we'll be one step ahead of him and we'll know what to do. But if we skip that responsibility, guess what? We're going to pay dearly. We're going to pay dearly. Because Satan, he thrives on taking advantage of, of believers. He takes advantage of believers who have not learned this book. He takes advantage of it. Any believer that haven't learned this book that they claim that they love, Satan going to take advantage of you. Got to know the word of God. Because Satan, Satan, he knows the word too. And he'll use the word against you. But he can't use it against you if you know it. And you got it in here. He can't steal it. That's what he come to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. God written world word is his revealed word. I'm gonna say that again. God's written word is his revealed word. In other words, it's his will. And Satan's going to take advantage of any scriptural ignorance that we might have. So we need to fill our soul, or mind you want to call it, with the truth of God's word. And not the, the trash and the of the unscriptural or religious teachings and traditions of men. That's why we will be able to discern between what is God and what is Satan when them darts start flying all about us. One thing I know, it ain't God's fault that we re refuse uh, we don't try to learn his word. It ain't his fault. No, that's our responsibility. But we're going to pay the penalty for it. We're going to pay the penalty for it. God said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. You can find that in Hosea 4, 6. And he's not talking about worldly knowledge. Now, don't get me wrong. Worldly knowledge is good. But God's not talking about worldly knowledge when he said that my people perish for the lack of knowledge. He's talking about the knowledge of him and his word. We perish because we don't know, a, a lot of people don't care about the word of God. Because they believe what they believe. They believe that man wrote it. And the superior being who is God didn't write this. That's why people perish because of the lack of knowledge. They think they got it all together. But if you don't know this word, you ain't got nothing together. You ain't going nowhere. What the pastor say, you're going down. You're going down. And I think at this point right here, it's important for me to reiterate that God does not contact us or communicate with us with the, through the soul of man. Because the soul is in contact only with the solidical realm. And God don't live in the solidical realm. God is a spirit. He lives in the spirit realm. He contacts us through our spirit, not through our soul. The soul of man is the mind of man. It's separate from the human spirit, but somehow 
I believe, and you, like I should say, you can put this on the shelf, that they are connected. I believe that they are connected. I believe that it's comprised of the will, the intellect, and the emotions. I believe that it's connected to the spirit, but it's not the spirit. I hope I'm not confusing him. <laughs> I believe it's important for us to get that right and uh, get it straight. So like I said, just put that up on the shelf. We could say a whole lot about that, but time is limited. And I'm uh, getting to my last part here. Uh, we're going to talk about the body of man. Okay. Now we come to the body of man. The body is the dwelling place and a vehicle of expression for the human spirit. Now, the body is not the real person. That's not the real person. The spirit is the real person. However, in order for the spirit to live in the earth realm, it's gotta be contained within the, the human body. Now the human body, a lot of times it's called the vehicle, it's called the tent, it's called the house for the spirit. Some people even call it the earth suit. I've heard people say that, the earth suit. You have to have a vehicle, a tent, or earth suit to live in the earth realm. God's thinking ahead. As soon as that vehicle fails, that human spirit immediately, not the next day, not an hour later, but immediately departs for one or two places, heaven or hell. And those two places, they don't require this, this vehicle. They don't require this vehicle. This vehicle is only required in the earthly realm. In another analogy, your body is the house where your spirit lives while you're here. Your body is the tenement, okay? Your spirit is the tenant. This is why when you speak to another human being, you look them directly in the eye. Because when you look them in the eye, you're looking in the window of that tenement. The eyes are the windows for the inner man. So we read earlier where Job said, there is a spirit in man, the spirit man, the real man is on the inside of this outer flesh, the tenement. Another way of looking at your body is like, just say you got a balloon. The air inside that balloon is the spirit. Once you let the air out of that balloon, you re well, you release the spirit in that balloon, the balloon goes down. Same with this body. Once the spirit leaves this body, it ceases to work. Hey, but one thing you can do with it, put it in the ground, take it to the graveyard. God does not communicate with the body of man. He communicates with the spirit of man. The body is in contact only with the physical realm. But God, again, does not live in the physical realm. God is a spirit. He lives in the spiritual realm. And he contacts us through our human spirit. When Jesus came on this earth, the first time he came as our redeemer. That was, his purpose was to begin the work of redemption 
And that redemption is not complete yet. It was the spirit man, the real man, that he came to restore back to God. When he came the first time. And he did that to keep us from going to hell. While the second part of his work is yet to come. It hadn't unfolded yet. As I said earlier, the new creation or the new birth. And that occurs only in the spirit man. From that point on, we become responsible for renewing this mind. God is not responsible for that. We got to renew our mind with the word of God. And we got the Holy Spirit. Jesus left us the Holy Spirit to help us with that. But the Holy Spirit ain't going to do it for us. He's not going to do it for us. We got to do that for ourselves. The Apostle Paul makes that very clear in Romans 12, 2. Would you put that up, Rick, please? Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed and progressively changed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, eventually, Christ is going to come back. He's going to come back to redeem our bodies as he redeemed, as he once came to redeem our spirit. And that's going to complete his task as the redeemer. You don't have to put this up, Rick, it, but this is evidenced by 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet call, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will ra be raised imperishable and will be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, you don't have to put this up either, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven and shout with a shout of a command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will simultaneously be caught up or raptured up together with them in the clouds and meet with the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words. Now, that just makes me feel so good knowing that one day I'm going to be changed. Even if I'm left here on this earth, if the Lord comes today, each one of us are going to be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. That's something to look forward to. That's something to look forward to. We see we have a hope beyond that grave out there. People walking around out there in the world that don't have the knowledge that we have because of this book right here, they don't have no hope. All they know is I'm going to live, die, and be buried. And that's it. A lot of people think that that's just it. They don't know where they're going to spend eternity. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. And I know you all do too. But the people that's listening to this DVD, some of them don't know where they're going to go. Some of them don't care. Because... They just want to fill up on the things of the world. And it's deceptions. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not become discouraged. Though our outer selves is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. That inner man that pastor is always talking about is becoming stronger and stronger every day as we believe and as we read this word of God. He's coming stronger and stronger. That's because the human spirit is already immortal. 
Our spirit is already immortal. It's going to live forever anyway. But where? We know where ours is going to be. We're going to be with the Lord. Even as God's spirit is immortal, ours is immortal because we are made in his image and in his likeness. Eventually, until the Lord returns, every human body on the face of this earth is going to fail. And then one day, releasing the immortal human spirit, one day the spirit's coming out of here. King Solomon referred to the spirit as a civil court. Rick, put up Ecclesiastes 12, 6 and 7, please. He said, earnestly remember your creator before the civil court, that's the court of life, is broken, or the golden bowl is crushed, or the pitcher at the fountain is shattered, and the wheel of the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now all this, when it says the silver cord of life is broken, this body. The golden bowl is crushed, this body. Or the pitcher at the fountain shattered, and the wheel of the cistern is crushed, this body. Then, the dust, it's going back to the dust. But the spirit is going to return. I mean, the, the body is going to go back to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. That's what I couldn't get my friend to understand. That God gave us, he breathed the breath of life in us and we became a, a living soul. That's what the Bible says. But that's your, our intellect. But see, what he couldn't understand is the Bible says we are made in the likeness of God. God is a spirit. What other likeness could we be made of if we not made in the likeness of the spirit? Ain't nothing else. He's spirit. And I couldn't get him to understand that. I just pray to God to change his heart. That's all I can do. Because once this body fails and that cord is loosened and that spirit travels to its eternal destination, this is why Paul wrote to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. If you're born again. If you're born again. So there you have it. Spirit, soul, and body. You're not a soul. You're not a body. You are a spirit. Created in the image and the likeness of the spirit God. The creator of all human spirits. It's vital for us to have a successful walk with the Lord. And to understand that we are a spirit. We possess a soul, but we live in a body. Pastor talks about walking in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, or uh, we live in the spirit, our speech changes. The things we say change. The place that we used to go, we don't go no more. The things that we used to indulge in, we don't indulge in those things anymore. Because we have seen the light. Jesus took us out of this darkness over here and brought us over here on this side of the cross into the light. Now we're walking in the spirit. God is faithful. God is faithful. His word is true. He said to be absent from the body is to be instantly and effortlessly in his presence. That's the good thing about it. When this body 
ceases to operate, we ain't got to do nothing. We don't have a task. We're going to automatically be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Ain't God all right? I'm t wow. But in the meantime, there's work to be done. And our job is to try and make sure everybody in this world of influence and everybody in this world of responsibility is ready to depart this earth suit when the time comes. We have to be instrumental in that with our family members, with people we meet on the street, people we shop with, uh, people we meet while we're shopping. We got a job to do. Once everything is over, we're going to the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we get rewards given or we get rewards taken away. All based on the actions and attitude we had while we was here on planet Earth. Some of us, we receive crowns, which represent positions of power and tremendous privileges. So it's very vital to our eternal existence that we don't live our probationary period selfishly. See, we're in a probationary period, you might want to say, but we can't live it selfishly. Because if Jesus, and this is for the folks that are watching this DVD, if Jesus is not your savior, you need to say, Jesus, you are my choice. You're going to be glad it did when it comes time, that time to, to lay this body down. And you come up out of this earth suit. You'll be glad you chose Jesus. But you got to remember that you are a spirit being. You possess a soul. And you just live in that body that you got. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in glorifying Jesus and sending us your spirit, you open the way to eternal life. May our sharing of this gift increase our love and make our faith grow stronger. May your spirit continue to cleanse our lives that the offering of ourselves to you, that it may be pleasing to you. We believe that you died and rose from the grave to purchase a place for us in heaven. And Lord Jesus, for those who don't know you, we pray that they will ask for forgiveness of their sins and repent of their sins and place their trust in you for their salvation to be saved. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, Father. And now, Father, we accept the free gift of eternal life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, our Lord, our Savior, our God. Amen.